IoT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric. The way we travel for work and leisure is undergoing a period of real transformation. We're already seeing autonomous vehicles on our streets and there's huge investment in rail infrastructure and high-speed trains. The talk is of mobility as a service and seamless customer journeys with digital innovation at the heart of these latest developments. And in the business-to-business -business world of ground transportation, digital technology is also shaking things up. In this programme, global manufacturer BMW reveals how building partnerships with its peers and across sectors is pushing boundaries. In Brussels, I'll find out how a disruptor business is developing real-time predictive maintenance solutions for train fleets. And in Paris, we'll ask an expert about the regulatory issues affecting companies operating in the B2B ground transportation sector. And we're going to have a glimpse of the future. What's going to be on offer in the B2B area and how will this transform the transport systems we know today? The motor giant BMW was founded in 1916 and its global headquarters are here in Munich in Germany. Its iconic logo, those blue and white triangles in a circle actually refer to its heritage because although it makes a whole range of vehicles now, that's not how it started. Its first products were engines for aircraft and the logo represents an aircraft's propeller. Someone with first-hand experience of corporate evolution and sector integration is Jens Monsis, BMW Group's Vice President of Strategy Digitalization. He describes the impact digital technology is having on BMW's business model. In the past, we had quite a vertical integration. So here's the customer, then there's the dealer, and then there is a producer. Like, like BMW, and then there are tier one suppliers where we get a lot of parts from. And, and this value chain is now becoming a network. So we go from purely vertical to more horizontal or networks with other partners. And why does digital technology enable that in a way that wasn't possible beforehand? All digital uh, systems are critical mass systems. I think this is very important to know. Um, because as more partners and as more um, devices you have integrated, as better is your data source, as more precise you can predict what you need to do and what behavior you can expect. And you cannot do this alone as we did in the past. So you need to build an ecosystem, a platform. So joint ventures are critical here. Yes. Partnerships, not, not always joint ventures, but partnerships in many sense. So we did, for example, um, together with Daimler and Audi, uh, the here acquisition. And um, it's a wonderful HD map that we need, obviously, for autonomous driving, but also for location-based services. We feed from all the different OEMs data into the system. For example, where the, the windshield wipers are on, so we know it's raining exactly at that spot. Um, and, and here is then collecting and obviously it makes sense that we have it as a platform and not that everybody has his own Right, so HD if I'm driving map. in my BMW and it rains yeah. and I turn my windscreen wipers on well, They will go by themselves Okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry very car. old tech <laughs> but my windscreen wipers start immediately at the moment it rains here in Munich yeah. The fact is that that will send that information not just to other BMW drivers but actually to your competitors because this is a non-competitive issue. You want everyone to share the data. Hey, uh, safety and security is one of our biggest uh, uh, concerns and, and why not sharing also to our competitor Audi or Daimler this data because we don't want car accidents, whatever the competition is. And by the way, also B2B perspective. I think um, we can learn uh, there from the valley um, that 
also Google and Apple and maybe Amazon, they are competing on one hand, what I call the frenemy concept. On the, on the other side, they are helping and supporting each other in a bigger sense and a bigger is ecosystem. So on an Apple phone, you have Google Maps and vice versa. And this is what we are trying to establish for the automotive valley, especially here in, in the German surrounding, but also with other players like uh, uh, Chrysler in the US, to, to have an ecosystem where we all pay in. For example, when we talk about autonomous driving, we now have a cooperation with Intel, with Mobileye, with tier one suppliers, with OEMs. It's a platform business. And it's a fun to see how all these different players are working together on our new campus. And, and I think this is the, the way of bringing in new technology into our group. One thing we haven't talked about, of course, is further behind the production process and how digital technologies are helping or changing the manufacturing process itself. I mean, when I talk about digital, I always say customer interface car and product and services and the third part and big part of our value chain is obviously the production and i would say that the first autonomous car or vehicle is driving in our production halls and in, in our factories we use more and more technology and robots to support our people and employees in the factories to do heavy lifting to sort out things, to transport things. But we've seen robots on production lines for many years. It's not particularly new. In the past, we see robots operating one move. Mm -hmm. Now what we see is that all the robots are connected in the brain, which is called IoT, and in the cloud, and in a network. So if robot 47 is doing something, robot 22 knows. The second is also additive manufacturing, the 3D printing of, of parts, then the designing of parts, not done by an engineer, but maybe by an AI algorithm who can develop a, 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 a piece that never should break down in a way that no engineer would do it. And is that happening now? It's happening now. BMW is a company with a very long heritage this, for instance, is the Izetta, a car which they produced back in the 1950s. Now, the BMW cars have come a long way since then, as has the company. I'm now off to see a much more recent disruptor in the ground transportation industry. Rail Nova is based here in Brussels. It was established in 2010, and what it's done is develop a predictive maintenance solution for the rail industry. Hi, Christian. Hello, Christian Sprower is the founder and CEO. With a background in mechanical engineering, he worked with several rail companies before launching Rail Nova. Rail Nova offers train operators um, a solution to access data on the train up to 6,000 parameters per second and to get alerted before failures happen. Before, they would have to wait until the failure happens and bring the train to the workshop. Now with Renova, they can be alerted up front and they can avoid certain failures and they can react much faster to other failures. Who are your clients at the moment? Our clients are train operating companies like Deutsche Bahn, SNCF, SNCB, the Netherlands uh, railway called NS or the Swiss railway called SBB, and some private operators, which are less known by the public. So spread around Europe? Yes, Europe and Kazakhstan and uh, soon Russia. How does the Internet of Things here play a crucial role in all of this? Yeah, so the Internet of Things is crucial because to access data on trains, we need to have hardware embedded inside the train. And RailNova solution includes a hardware device, which is universal and enables to connect all the train subsystems. The device has been designed in-house and Christian took me along to show me one. So this device is what we design and uh, manufacture and this is fitted to the train. Right. So, so this one box? This one box. Does all of that monitoring? Yes, it gathers up to 6,000 signals. Right. And how it does that is with a cable kit which is then installed on the train connecting all the subsystems of the train. 
and we connect it like this. And here we go, 6,000 signals. And how are you getting the actual data back to base? We send it with a SIM card to the cloud, but we cannot send 6,000 signals right. every millisecond to the cloud on a SIM card. It's too much data. So it has to be processed and we only send a subset of that data. So the box itself is not just a channel for data, that's an intelligent brain doing analysis yes. in location this, live. This is software, this is intelligence, and it's at the edge, that's why we call it edge intelligence. So give me some examples of what sort of things you're measuring amongst the 6,000 feeds you're yes. taking from a train. So for example, for a uh, electrical train, we would measure the overhead voltage, the engine current, the engine speed, uh, the braking force, the traction force, the energy consumption. The energy consumption is a good predictor of whether there's a problem on the train or not. So a train consuming more energy for the same kind of traffic would probably have a problem on the traction uh, systems. Those alerts, when something happens on the train which says that's, that's not right, where does that alert go? Does it go directly to the driver? So it cannot go to the driver because the driver has to operate the train according to safety, to certain safety principles. So the alert goes to the train control center, which then has to make a decision on whether this is a stopping failure and they have to stop the train, or whether the train can go to the end of the mission and then go to the workshop, or whether this alert is not a problem and the train can continue. So although it's highly technologically driven, the actual decisions are being made by people. Yes, decisions are always made by people because they are safety relevant. So this is a dashboard that feed managers see right. uh, from the central location. Each line here is a different train. Yes, so they can see what type of train it is, who is managing it, what is the status uh, of the trains. So all these red boxes, they're warning signs, aren't yes. they? So th we help the client go from getting a raw alert to confirming a diagnostic to taking an action. So we see that this train is in degrading mode so that it cannot drive normally. And why that is because there's a critical battery alert that was triggered. Right. And the, the fleet manager can actually inspect this alert. Oh, and, wow. he, and he can see that over the past hours, the battery voltage has decreased up to a critical level. Can you give us an idea of the sort of commercial advantage that this product offers a train operating company? One advantage is energy consumption reduction. So on diesel trains, we can identify the best driver pattern over the same route and reduce the energy consumption by 5%. By coaching the drivers on the best driving practices, we call this the golden run, and every driver tries to achieve the golden run, and as a whole, the company reduces the fuel expenses by 5%. Another uh, is the availability of the fleet. From having to keep 10% uh, of the fleet as a reserve to cope for failures, you can now go to 100% availability on your fleet. And you can go to full trains in service for uh, busy weekends. And, and this could not be possible before. Ground transportation is a sprawling industry with a whole raft of regulations to comply with. In part two, I'll find out more about these regulatory regimes. Digital technologies are changing ground transportation in many different ways, and the regulators have to stay ahead of those changes. But what are the regulatory frameworks which companies operating in the B2B field must comply with and what are the challenges involved? So in terms of regulation, safety is paramount. So those solutions cannot endanger safety. What about the international aspect of this? Just coming to meet you today, I crossed three different countries in a train. No doubt they have three different regulatory regimes yeah. and you're trying to sell into all of those regulatory regimes. What sort of a headache does that cause for you? So in terms of uh, safety uh, regulation, they are indeed local, local to each country. But there's a European framework for safety. And this has been uh, driven by liberalization of the railway. And this is much better now than it was 10 years ago. So we can now go to each country with a similar dossier, with a similar safety case, and deploy our solution on the trains. One of the regulatory preoccupations for Jens Monsis at BMW is around the way data is shared between the companies BMW works with. 
in our connected uh, service and app, you can already say right now, okay, I want to have with my insurance a system where I insure my car as pay as you drive. But obviously the insurance need to have the data as you drive. So you can send, say, on your connected, I give these data points controlled over our backend to this um, insurance company. This is possible now. And there we are very, very um, sensitive of what kind of personalized data we give to a third party. What is the current regulatory position over the protection of personal data? Over in Paris, Philip Christ is a project manager with the International Transport Forum. It's important first to understand that there is no global regulatory framework for the collection and use of data. That depends really on national jurisdictions and multinational jurisdictions, as in the case of the EU. In Europe, it's the GDPR. That is the rule that will handle how data is collected, who processes it, and how citizens still retain access over the use of that data, the ultimate use of that data. Now, that is predicated on a relationship where people who collect data or companies that collect data um, may be sharing that data with others. And for that, under the GDPR, they will have to have set rules on when they do that, how they do that, and ensure that consumers agree to that. The GDPR, or General Data Protection Regulation, comes into force in May 2018. How does Christian Sprauer view it? It's a very good regulation. It will have some cost of implementation, but it will actually give us a common framework to handle these kind of issues. But isn't there a problem in, for instance, if you're measuring the reaction time of a specific named driver to a braking incident, you suddenly have quite personalised data, data about that person. How are you controlling that? So this requires very tight controls in, in, that are built into the software. So each data is ownership stamped so that we can delete the data from a particular driver or from a particular user afterwards if uh, a client asks us. And this, this requires a lot of traceability that is built into the software. So the privacy side is very much necessary to regulate. Uh, the B2B rela uh, relation where no personal data are exchanged is more company to company uh, agreement of what we want to do. For example, when I use maybe um, data in our autonomous driving from other OEMs, let's say Fiat Chrysler or others, then it enriches our whole tech stack and we have to find an agreement then with Conti or Fiat Chrysler what's the best way. I think going forward that framework will be possibly passed over by changes in data science where the release of data isn't at the core of insight sharing but the way in which we can send information requests to specific data um, bases. Um, that will enable a lot more insight being extracted from the data that's collected on these individuals without ever releasing the data from behind that firewall. And that's really where a lot of the privacy concerns are. If that data is released from, the fire, from behind the company firewall and then shared and then used for purposes for which it wasn't collected, that's the real risk both for individuals but also for companies because that's commercially relevant and commercially valuable information. But there's a significant cost attached to complying with these regulations. As we are trying to make our solution work and adopted by users, this is an extra burden that we have to build into the product. But it's, it's like safety, it's a prerequisite. So it's necessary to gain the trust of our clients and that's why we focus on it. Compliance demands some investment, as of course does research and development. So, in part three, I'll be looking at the digital innovations in the pipeline for companies in the B2B world of ground transportation. Our experience of transport systems is changing rapidly, but what does the future hold for B2B in the ground transportation sector? My vision for, for the future is that railway can become uh, predictive only, so that they can detect all failures before they happen and they can anticipate. So they can move from reactive to predictive. And what about your product in particular? What new things do you hope it to do in the coming years? So the new things will really be about uh, detecting new patterns on the edge inside the train. 
even patterns that we haven't seen or came, come across before. So that every time there's a new failure that happens, we even can catch this one in advance. And how might you achieve that? What's the path towards that sort of learning? So the path to that is, is to, to train machine learning models and to gather a lot of data over the years on a lot of different trains and to analyze this data and to try to find the new patterns. And if that was achieved, the sort of change that would have on society and businesses would be what? Engineers would have much less headaches, trains would probably be cheaper to run and uh, more efficient. So the train would become more competitive, basically. What will digital innovation mean for BMW's business-to-business -business operations in the future? Maybe at one point we should talk to airlines, and we are already talking to um, cities to provide a seamless journey full of convenience and premium aspects from A to B. So you need, after our talk, to go back. You will use trains, taxis, aeroplanes, maybe even bikes or you walk on foot. And my vision is that this journey then is totally seamless. Now you have to find all the things differently and, and you have to make many contracts with the taxi driver, with the rental car, with the airline and so on. And my, my dream in the future that is all in one journey. So in the future I might sit in my BMW and it's sort of my travel agent. It goes, you want to come yeah. from this city to London yeah. and I'll just sort that out for you. And part of it will be in my car but part of it will be because BMW has relationships with the airline or the taxi company. And integrated services in our smart car. Otherwise, um, uh, if we don't integrate all these different uh, user journeys, um, then we stay monolithic and, and then we will not be um, that premium and convenient. And therefore, I think we are exactly on the right track to do this as a leader. It seems to me, what you're saying also, that the future in business-to-business -business relationships is in fact not just business-to-business, -business, but business-to-city, business-to-government. The, the world will come together. So that will be, I think, for society a big change. So we should not longer look at country barriers or, or borders. The planet, because we are all living in the same boat, will come closer together. And, and I think digital plays a huge role in it. Not just an internet of things in the future, an internet of companies, an interconnected n network it's of businesses. A social and network, a social network, because companies are also social. Yeah, we, we have to make our stake for a cleaner air or cleaner planet. So it, I think the, the uh, co working and the, the integration of things and to open up doors and, and borders and boundaries it will be the new normal and the, the companies that are best in it will also be very successful in this different future. And what place in the future does Christian Sprower think the railway system will have? I think with autonomous dr uh, cars coming there will be a big shift and rail has to again stay more competitive than what it is today. In crowded areas like urban uh, cities, rail is um, at the default uh, mode of transport, but in, in long distance rail, this is where rail will face a greater challenge to autonomous driving, for example. And uh, this is where uh, high speed rail and train on time are going to be crucial. Digital technology is revolutionizing the whole ground transportation sector. But, but this isn't just about products and services because what is clear is that digital innovation is changing the very nature of business-to-business -business relationships. IOT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric.